God's people said. Amen. What a great day it is to gather and to be able to praise the Lord and just lift him up for all that he has done for us, his protection this week, his watch care over us. Folks, I'm even thankful that we just had a good old-fashioned tick killing this week. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And I want you to know that we need to be thankful and praise the Lord for our pastor. A lot of times we don't think about it. Pastoring the flock, shepherding the sheep, is more than just feeding spiritually. It's looking after all of their needs. And he had a tough decision to make this week concerning our worship service today. And we praise him uh, for letting the Lord guide him in this. Yeah. And we're glad to see you here today, that you're here worshiping with us. If you're listening online, if you're a part of worshiping by electronic means, we're thankful that you have chosen to do that today. Uh, you didn't have to come and worship the Lord together, uh, either over the airways or over uh, here in the sanctuary. Thank you for being here today. We would ask you to take out your electronic device, whether you're here or at home, and go to fbclexington.com. You can actually use the QR code that is available. Uh, it's on the screen. It's on the pew in front of you. And uh, go to Sunday Central, check in, and let us know that you're here today, especially if you're listening uh, over the uh, live stream, let us know that you're a part of this worship service with us today. While you're there, you'll find the sermon notes for the pastor's message. You'll find uh, opportunities for the week listed, what we'll be doing. Uh, you'll find the, uh, the opportunity to give there. And it's very important that we give and support the work of our church. You know, unexpected expenses come up. We hired uh, some snow removal this week. Uh, ice removal, I guess is what it was. But uh, those things happen. So give and give faithfully, whether you're listening at home or here in the auditorium. Our men are going to come forward and take the offering here. Uh, you can, uh, again, give it online. You can uh, drop it in the offering plate, mail it to the office, or come by. But let's give, and let's give faithfully. Would you join with us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a time together, a time to worship a time to see friends, and you've blessed us so much in our um, financials, and we just ask that uh, what we give back is uh, something that will be blessed beyond measure, and we know that uh, you are a God who blesses. We just thank you for that, and we thank you for the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and keep worshiping together like we have been doing this morning. Our Lord is on his way back. He's got to uh, bring with us Bring us with him, and so let's give him praise and proclaim that good news this morning. Yeah, but he's coming on the cloud.
Thank you so much this morning, choir, congregation. Appreciate all of you being here this morning. I know there's lots of places around our county. Folks just simply can't get out today. And uh, they still can't get out. And we got a lot of places around the county that does that they happen to have no water. And we are, are certainly uh, thankful, those of you who are able to come today, those who are out there watching online today, we welcome you as well. I want you to take your Bible today and look with me in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll begin reading in a moment in verse 13. Two Sundays ago, we started a new sermon series called Embracing Generosity. Let me remind you of the statement that we're using to define generosity, and it's this. Generosity is offering up something you genuinely love or value for someone you choose to love and value more. In week one, I told you how generosity is contagious. Last Sunday, we talked about how generosity is cultivating. And we talked about the law of the harvest, and you reap that which you sow. Today, I want you to see that generosity is courageous. Generosity is courageous. There used to be a reality television show on the A&E channel every Monday night called Hoarders. Hoarders. In 2011, Hoarders was nominated for an Emmy Award for, quote, outstanding reality TV show, if you can imagine. The show documents people from all walks of life and backgrounds who literally are compulsive about hoarding possessions. In some cases, the possessions are valuable. But in most cases, that which was being hoarded was completely and absolutely worthless. It is estimated that some 3 million plus people in the United States, they are compulsive hoarders. It is also determined that as many as 7 out of 10 Americans hoard possessions to some degree. In fact, the United States of America is the only place on earth where people will park a $50,000 vehicle in the driveway in order to fill their garage with a bunch of junk. America's the only place where people will pay money to rent a storage building to store stuff every month they've not used in years. If you study hoarding, you'll realize that some psychiatrists and psychologists call the condition disposophobia, or the fear of losing or giving away one's possessions. The Bible word for disposophobia or hoarding is the word Greed. Greed. In English, we might add a thesaurus of words such as materialism, selfishness, stinginess, or we might even say someone is a miser. The Bible often exposes this condition as the issue of greed or a lack of generosity. And in our passage of Scripture today, we see such a person as described by Jesus. Some call this as the parable of of the rich young fool. Beginning in verse 13 of Luke 12, we read this. Someone from the crowd said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, Who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? He told them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed. Because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all of my grain and all of my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up 
for many years, take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. As we sit here in this sanctuary this morning, I realize the fact that many of you are not necessarily compulsive hoarders. However, oftentimes, if we were really brutally honest with ourselves, we cannot deny the fact that sometimes... We can be greedy. Sometimes we can be selfish. Sometimes we genuinely lack generosity. In fact, our natural bit in life is to work hard to provide first for ourselves, to get or to obtain more. And in America, we seem to have this mad dash competition to see who can acquire the most and the biggest, the fastest. The question we've got to ask ourselves is why? Why do, why do we do this? What is the common source behind this mindset? Why are we often greedy? Why do we act like we're in competition for things and possessions? Why are we so materialistic? The Bible shows us the reason we are this way and the reason we are oftentimes not generous is because of fear. Fear. Think about it. It's fear that keeps us from being obedient to God. It's fear of losing what we have. It's fear of being able to replace our time, our treasure, and our talents if they're used or given away. It's the fear of not being able to find something we think we might need. All of these fears of loss, the loss of our time, the loss of our treasure, the loss of our talents, leads our hearts to not be generous but to be greedy. We read in Proverbs 21, 26, they are always greedy for more while the godly love to give. This was the case of the man described by Jesus in the parable in our scripture today. We see him having been blessed by God. Just the way God blesses us so many times. I mean, he was blessed. His fields had been productive. And when given the opportunity to be generous with God's blessings or to be greedy with God's blessings, this man made the decision, I will build bigger barns. That's what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. Uh, let me show you what it looks like at a Baptist church. In a Baptist church, it's a growing small group Sunday school class. And instead of starting a new class from the class they have, they'll come to the pastor and say, well, what you really ought to do is just give us a bigger room. Now, I know we ought to multiply, but that's not how we want to multiply. We, we just need a bigger room. That'll solve all of our problems. It's the same kind of mindset. His goal was that in fear of giving or losing his possessions, his life was going to change from what he wanted it to be. And it was caused by fear. So what does this fear do in our lives? Several things. First, fear steals God's praise. It steals God's praise. We see that in verse 16. A rich man's land was very productive. The man feared losing and using what he had. So what did he do? In fear, he focused selfishly on himself and what he could do with the things that he had. Look at the number of times this passage from verse 16 through 18 where this man used the words I, me, and my. 
When fear causes us to focus on ourselves and our own wants and our own needs, we take praise that belongs to God alone. We love to run into the spotlight that belongs to God. We like to bask in God's spotlight that doesn't belong to us. We like to focus the attention on ourselves. This man was saying that he was productive. He had so much because of his own efforts. And he didn't give praise to God. Jesus did not have a bit of problem with this man being wealthy. In fact, to Jesus, this was simply a sign to point this man that he had been blessed by God. In fact, he may have been generous in the past. And so God had blessed him with fields that were productive. But now that his barns were full and his life had abundance, his fear in losing these things caused him to lose generosity. You see, the issue is never wealth. When it comes to generosity, the issue is never amount. The issue of generosity is always attitude. This man was self-focused because of personal fears. So he wanted to take credit for the blessings that God had given him. And so he talked about his fields and his productivity and his barns and his wealth as if it all belonged to him. We're kind of guilty, aren't we? We like, to sp we like to steal God's spotlight. We love for people to look at us and see what we've done or what we possess or what position we hold and what talent we have and praise us. We forget that the reason God has blessed us is so that we can be generous to others by offering up something we love and genuinely value for someone we choose to love and value more fear steals God's praise fear does the second thing fear ignores God's plans it ignores God's plans you see this in verse 17 and 18 look at what it said there he thought to himself what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all of my grain and all of my goods there. Now, this guy would have made a great Baptist. He'd have just been a great Baptist. You see, when we fear losing and using our time and our talents and our treasures, we automatically began to think inwardly. We start to think selfishly about how we need to protect that which we see as ours so that we can better use these things for ourselves. We start to make our own plans. We start to fill in dates on our calendar and set up our own activities and schedules. Our lives will go through life without even considering or giving a thought to what might be God's will or God's plan in all of this. We simply don't want God to interfere with our barns and our plans. The farmer said to himself, what shall I do? And then he said, this is what I will do. The problem here is not wanting to build newer or better or even bigger barns. The problem was that the farmer thought first about himself. Here's what I will do for me. He didn't think for others. The problem is also that at no time did he even consider or even question, what would God have me do? He only thought about what he would do for himself and all his plans. God was left out. How often does God get left out of your plans? How often does God get left out of our decisions? How often is God left out of our finances or our relationships? 
How often is God left out of our job and our career or our home or our school? When God is left out, so is generosity. Because fear steals God's praise. Fear ignores God's plans. But there's a third thing. Fear feeds our personal pride. He said in verse 19, Then I'll say to myself, You have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. I mean, as you read these words, we almost all want to shrink down in our seats thinking to ourselves, surely this guy wasn't that arrogant. Surely he really didn't think that way. Surely he didn't say those things or really do this. The reason we get so uncomfortable reading these prideful words in verse 19 is because we are reading words that have oftentimes run through our own minds or come out of our own mouths. We've thought these thoughts, haven't we? And our pride, we've commended ourselves and we've almost broken our arms trying to pat ourselves on the backs. We have lots of concerns and fears about ourselves, don't we? We have lots of concerns and fears about our future, don't we? Financially, our nation and many people's lives are a mess. Health-wise, many people are struggling and they're having tests and surgeries and they don't know what's going to happen. Relationships are at an all-time high mess. Every time you turn around and you look, investments once thought to be ironclad are now not considered to be secure, but oftentimes are in jeopardy. Some people who have relied upon others to speak truth in our past no longer are with us to speak that truth. Life as we know it is filled with uncertainties and fears. And when this happens, our natural tendency is to allow our fear to make us self-centered. We began to hoard our resources in difficult times. We began to stop using our time or talents for others. We are what is very evident to us in our lives is that we fill ourselves with pride. And as Americans, we get that idea that we can just pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. So we put all of our focus on days of fear on our own plans and our own barns and our own barnyard and our own tractors and our own crops and our own selves. Listen to this warning from James 4, 13 through 17. Here's what James said. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend the year there, carry on business and make money, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Fear steals God's praise. Fear ignores God's plans. Fear feeds our personal pride. Fourthly, fear puts our treasures in the wrong place. We read in verse 20, but God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Now folks, these are some very strong and sobering words right here. In Scripture, a fool is one who leaves God out of the center of his or her life. A fool is one who does not consider God in their decisions or their actions, their thoughts, or their plans. And here's how the psalmist describes it in Psalm 14, 1. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. That is exactly how the farmer was acting and thinking. He was acting as if God did not exist or as if he was not accountable unto God for his life 
and the things that he possessed. Look at this closely this morning. To be a fool is to miss what life is really all about. Think about it. The person that Jesus says is foolish, we would look at this farmer in our own worldly mindset and we would have said, this guy is a raving success. We would have seen him as one of the primary business people in our community and in our county. We would have thought him to be a model investor and manager of resources. We would have wanted him to come and speak at the Chamber of Commerce banquet and speak to the Rotary Club. And Jesus says that this guy is nothing more than a foolish person who had an opportunity to make a difference with his life to make a difference with his talents, to make a difference with his treasures, and he completely chose to miss it all. He's foolish. This guy cared more about his possessions than he did other people. He was more concerned with building his barns than he was in building the kingdom of God. He was much more invested in a wasted life than he was invested in any works of love. He was so fearful of losing and using his earthly treasure that he completely forgotten that one second after breathing his last breath, it was all worthless to him. It was all meaningless. It was all powerless. That the moment he stood before God, all that mattered in that moment was the treasure that he had laid up or invested in heaven because of a life and a heart and an attitude of generosity. I'm really afraid this morning that right here in our own congregation, we have a number of people who are allowing their fears to cause them to put their treasures and their talents and their time in the wrong places. Some of you are building your own barns that are going to amount to nothing but to be temporarily torn down, lost, and removed, and will do absolutely nothing eternal for the kingdom of God, either on this side of glory or on the other side of glory. It's time for us to decide today that we want to invest our lives in the kingdom of God and in things which are eternal. Fear steals God's praise. Fear ignores God's plan. Fear feeds our personal pride. Fear puts our treasures in the wrong place. One final quick thing. Fear robs us of God's providence. Look at verse 21. Here's what Jesus said. And this is how it will be, how it is, with a one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Sometimes we mistakenly think that when we read this passage of Scripture, it's so sad to think that this guy had so much, had built up so much and then left it all behind. I want you to understand this morning the tragedy in the story is not what the man left behind. The tragedy of the story is that he faced God having laid up for himself no treasures in heaven. Jesus said he was not rich toward God. Now what does it mean to be rich toward God? Well, I'm glad you ask. To be rich toward God means to gratefully acknowledge God's providence in our life. It is giving thanks to God and acknowledging in practical ways that everything we have comes from Him. To be rich toward God means that we generously use all of God's blessings for the good of others and for God's glory. Generous people choose to live their lives with faith in God to provide providentially all that they need, rather than living their lives in fear of losing 
and using what they have. The truth is that it's only in being generous with the things that we have and the person that we are by faith that we experience a generosity from God in and through our lives toward others that builds up treasures in heaven. Let me show you the difference between the two things. Fear leads to greed. Faith leads to generosity. Fear leads to hoarding. Faith leads to treasures in heaven. Fear robs you of abundant life. Faith allows you to realize an abundant life. Fear steals your joy. Faith secures your joy. Fear creates stress. Faith creates satisfaction. Fear makes you callous toward others. Faith makes you consider others. Fear is selfish. Faith is sacrificial. Fear examines worldly cost. Faith only exalts Christ. No one in this room this morning likes to think of themselves as being greedy or selfish. Yet, what we learn from the Word of God today is that if you are not being generous and living a life of generosity toward others and toward God, then you're being greedy. You're either one or the other. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. There's no in-between. Let me conclude by sharing this story with you. King Rama IV, known as the King of Siam, who ruled what is now modern-day Thailand from 1851 to 1868, had a very unusual strategy for tormenting and destroying his enemies. If the king had an enemy that he simply wanted to torment and to remind his enemy that he had power over him, then the king of Siam would send his enemy a very unique gift. You know what it was? A white elephant, an albino elephant. It's where we get the idea of a white elephant gift. He sent him a white elephant. Now, the reason that King of Siam did this is because these animals during this time were considered to be sacred in the culture of their day. So the recipient of such an elephant, such a gift, had no choice but in the eyes of other people to intentionally care for the gift. This type of elephant took inordinate amounts of the enemy's time, energy, and resources every day. In fact, over time, the white elephant became nothing but a burden. Caring for it and maintaining this animal for what would be many, many years that it would live up to as many as 50 years. And it was a reminder every day that the king of Siam was the enemy and was the one who burdened you with the gift. Here's what I know this morning. Among the people of God, we have filled our lives and our homes and our calendars and our finances and our jobs and our families full of white elephants. We've simply taken things which are nothing but things. We've taken talents, we've taken our own time, and we have applied those things, and we have given those things to anyone and everyone other than the Lord. 
We've taken that which God has blessed us with, and instead of using it for the good of others and for His glory, we have consumed it ourselves, feeding our own white elephants. Using up our own energy, using up our own resources, using up, using up our own materials in order to feed our own personal wants, our own personal desires, and the things that we treasure most. While at the same time, wondering to ourselves, why doesn't God bless me more? Why does God seem to be distant from me? Why is God not working in my life like He's working in that person's life? Why does it seem that I can't hear God's voice? Why does it seem that I take one step forward and two steps back every time? You know the answer, don't you? Generosity. Generosity. The source of generosity is God himself who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God has given us everything providentially we need to have an abundant, fulfilled, meaningful life. And it all starts in Jesus. So my question to you this morning is, number one, do you know Jesus? If not, today ought to be the day of salvation. Secondly, if you do know Jesus, then why are you worshiping the white elephants of your life instead of Him? Why are the white elephants of your life getting the best of you instead of Him? Why are the white elephants of your life getting the best of your time and your talents and your treasure instead of the Lord? who gave his all for you. Why would you go one more day focused on you rather than focused on the Lord and storing up for yourself treasures in heaven? It's a test. It's a test of what we are and it's a test of who we really are before God. My prayer is that this morning this morning, you'll no longer allow fear to hold you back. Fear of what other people think. Fear of what's going to happen next. That you would simply choose to walk with God by faith, with your life, with your, with your possessions, with your abilities, with your time, with your calendar, with your everything, starting today. Maybe you're here and you need to make this your church home. We'd love to have you come today. A statement of faith or by letter. We're going to pray together. We're going to have a time of invitation. We invite you to come. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Father, that you have invested so much in us. Well, Lord, you've done it so that we might first give back to you and so that we might use that which you've given to us to make a difference in the lives of others. God, I pray that we would stop worshiping the white elephants of our lives, of our own making. White elephants that sometimes, Lord, that we've allowed to be put there by the enemy, by Satan himself, to distract us away from you and your work and your ministry. Lord, I pray that we would stop being holy hoarders. And Lord, we would invest our lives in all that we have in your kingdom so that we might invest our lives in something that is eternal and not temporary. I pray that no longer we be ruled by fear, but by faith. I pray for those that need to have the faith to come and be saved today. I pray for Christians that ought to have the faith to come today and to turn over the white elephants to you, Father, and to start following you. Give this time to you, Father, as an offering of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand and sing with us. As the Holy Spirit of God leads you, we invite you to come this morning.
seated this morning you continue responding to the invitation today right there with the QR code on the back of your pew we're out there online you see at fbclexington.com Sunday Central you can go to the responding to God block or you can text us at 81010 and put in the subject line at FBC online or you can email me Clay Hallmark at fbclexington.com if we have guests here today we're so glad to have you and just a few moments guests we're gonna have a pastor's reception for you where some of our staff will be there